Satan's Sideshow, The True Lauren Stratford Story Step right up. It's Satan's Underground. A hundred thousand copies in print. Featured on radio and TV, from Geraldo to the 700 Club. Stories of satanic rituals, snuff films, and human sacrifice. Author Lauren Stratford survived to tell us all about it. Now judge for yourself. This article is the extraordinary chronicle of how one woman's gruesome fantasy was twisted into seeming fact. Perhaps the people who believed her tell felt the illusion of evidence she offered was due to the desperate times in which we live, times when little children are horribly abused and yet seem to find no rescue or protection from the authorities or the courts. But we believe these child victims can be protected from further harm and exploitation only if those who work on their behalf do so with absolute integrity, honesty, and responsibility. Sensational stories may sell more books, generate more television appearances, and provide more visibility to one's cause, and one may believe them because they're too bizarre not to be true, but they should never be substituted for careful, accurate, and truthful reporting. In the course of our research into the Satan's Underground, one, story, we talked with parents of children who had been ritually abused and who had reason to believe Lauren Stratford's testimony was not true. We asked them why they were willing to tell us what they knew, when, after all, her story supported their children's statements. One parent spoke for them all. We're so afraid that no one will believe our children. If this story were true, it would be invaluable. But we know it's not, and the only testimony worse for our children than no testimony is a testimony that's not true. If we can't find the courage to speak out and tell what we know about Lauren Stratford's story, then we're sitting ducks for the people we know are guilty and who are just looking for a way to discredit our children, too. The hard evidence we have uncovered and which we present here speaks for itself. The story of Satan's underground is not true and the same exploited children it may have been designed to help have been cheated of the truth. Satan's Underground A synopsis of the story told in Satan's Underground is very difficult to produce. The book is missing dates, places, outside events, and even the true names of the principal characters necessary for placing the story in an historical and geographical context. Stratford says, in part this is for my own protection but it also serves to remind you that what I've endured is not limited to one city or region. I have also changed names and descriptions of many key figures in order to protect the victims. 3. According to Satan's Underground, Stratford was born illegitimately and adopted at birth by a professional couple. Her adoptive father left when Lauren was four because of his wife's explosive temper and physical abuse toward him. At six Lauren was raped in her basement by a day laborer. 4. The rape was the mother's idea of a fair wage for the laborious work. The rapes continued by various smelly men, and under her mother's authority child pornography pictures and bestiality were added when she was 8. Throughout childhood, Lauren received the physical abuse her mother had previously heaped on her husband. Several times Lauren tried to tell adults what was happening, but neither her school counselor, pastor, youth group leader, nor a woman sent by the police believed her. At 15, after a particularly brutal physical altercation with her mother, Lauren collected bus fare donations from her school friends and escaped to a city 200 miles away. She ended up in Juvenile Hall and was picked up by her father, whom she had not seen in 11 years. She moved across the country with him rather than returning to live with her mother. Lauren had only lived with her father for a short time when her mother called insisting he allow them to come and get Lauren to continue the pornographic abuse. She then realized the multistate extent of the pornography ring her mother had inducted her into as a child. By the time she turned 20, Lauren had been living a dual life, five, at home, with her father, at church, and in school, and at the pornographer's studio, mostly on weekends. It was then she met the leader of the ring, Victor. She learned that Victor's empire included pornography, prostitution, drugs, sadomasochism, and child prostitution and pornography. Victor wanted her to be his woman, but she had to pass a test first. For several weekends in a row she had to properly pleasure his best customers, no matter what their perversions, demands, or tortures. 
she passed the test. Victor had his assistant hold her while he used a razor blade on her forehead to initiate her as his woman. The sexual perversion didn't end, she just responded to Victor's whims instead of any and all customers. She managed to continue her college studies despite the drugs and the torturous weekends with Victor. But Victor got bored. What was left to excite and thrill him? Satanism. It was, he told Lauren, the ultimate path to power and sexual gratification. At first he forced her to attend satanic rituals, six, where he and others sexually abused her. Then he demanded she participate in a child sacrifice ritual. She refused and underwent brainwashing and torture for an unspecified period of time. Finally Victor threatened he would ritually kill a baby each week that she continued to refuse. After holding out for four weeks, she was locked in a metal drum with the dead bodies of four babies who had been sacrificed. She finally gave in and evidently participated in an infant sacrifice ritual on Halloween night. She says, it was the last time I ever participated in a satanic ritual. 7. A later chapter in the book tells that sometime during her late teens and early twenties she gave birth to three children. The first two were killed shortly after birth in snuff films and the third, a son she calls Joey, was sacrificed in her presence at a ritual. When Lauren's father unexpectedly died, she realized she had no real reason to stay in the area. Thus began her frantic flight from Victor and his conspiratorial enforcers. She moved to many cities over the next few years, eight, but Victor's men always found her and continued periodic threats to ensure her silence. Her emotional and physical health deteriorated as a consequence of the extreme abuse she had suffered. During one eight-year period she was hospitalized more than 40 times. Her breakthrough, enabling her to begin the healing process, began with some sensitive hospital therapists. She learned that she didn't have to be a victim any longer. But she was far from well. Then she saw Johanna Michelsen on television. Somehow Lauren knew that her physical and spiritual healing would be accomplished through her. But it was another 18 months before she and Johanna met. After their first meeting, Lauren moved in with Johanna. Johanna and her entire family, including her husband, sister Kim, and brother-in-law Hal Lindsay, ministered healing to Lauren. In a number of months a new Lauren and a new book emerged from a fierce spiritual battle. The victim is beginning to be left behind, the victorious counselor appears. The stage is set for the counselor's handbook, I know you're hurting. Such is the story of Satan's underground. Who is Lauren Stratford? Lauren Stratford doesn't exist, except as the pen name of Laurel Rose Wilson and Satan's Underground is only one of the stories she's told about her life. Laurel Wilson was born prematurely to Marian E. Disbrow, 9, on August 18, 1941, 10, in St. Joseph's Hospital in Tacoma, Washington, 11. She was brought home after four to four days in the hospital by her adoptive parents, physician Frank Cole Wilson and schoolteacher Rose Gray Wilson, to a little town called Buckley. The littlest Wilson joined her big sister Willow Nell, who was five years older. Laurel's adoption by the Wilsons was finalized on February 17, 1942, before her first birthday. In a signed statement Willow prepared for us, she described her parents. My parents were devout Christians. They were both active members of the Bible Presbyterian Church in Tacoma. Both of them were fully committed to the Lord Jesus Christ. My sister and I were raised in a very sheltered, strict Christian home. There was no place in our home for anything remotely occult or pornographic. My mother continues as a dedicated Christian, for many years now a member of underscore 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 12, church, 13. One assumes from Satan's underground that its author is an only child. There is no mention of any sibling. The average reader would also assume that Stratford's mother is probably dead, which would explain why Stratford neither confronted nor reconciled with her mother as part of her spiritual and emotional healing. Neither assumption is true. Laurel's Early Childhood The Wilson home at 1624 A Street was not peaceful. 
Rice had an unpredictable temper, and Frank, with an explosive temper of his own, was often the brunt of her outbursts. His health was precarious, the result of a heart attack, and the stress on him was taxing. Willow was Laurel's protector and comforter, and many Saturday and Sunday afternoons were spent in the park together, hiking or riding bikes. Willow remembers life for her and Laurel during this time was very unpredictable. They never knew if mother would be in one of her rages or would take them to the beach for the day. But even the anger Willow remembers is nothing like what Satan's underground describes. My mother did have a temper. And she did have problems. But she loved us. My mother was never involved with pornography. No, no. No, no, and no. Mother would be absolutely appalled. She's very straight-laced, 14. In actuality, Frank left the family in 1950, 15, when Laurel was nine years old, not when she was four as Satan's underground describes. This was after the family had moved from Buckley to 805 North Sea in nearby Tacoma. Both Frank and Willow were living with Laurel and her mother during the time period that Laurel wrote in her book she was being repeatedly raped and used in child pornography and bestiality. I was never part of a porno empire, Willow explains Riley. And let me tell you, I was a very inquisitive little kid, with my ear to the door. If there had been any sort of business going on like that, believe me, I would have known about it. 16. Laurel was very musically gifted. Her adoptive parents plied her with music lessons, including voice, piano, clarinet, and flute. One of her singing competition judges wrote when Laurel was eight, outstanding accomplishment for length of study. This must be a very intelligent and musical girl. 17. Her report cards reflect almost straight A's. Her attendance and grades precluded long absences from school such as would have seemed necessary from the extreme sexual abuse described in Satan's Underground, 18. Her later childhood. During Laurel's high school years, she was active in school clubs and extracurricular activities. Returning from a singing engagement, Laurel and two friends were involved in an auto accident. Laurel had a minor ankle injury and both members of the trio recall that she was extremely distraught in the car and in the hospital, continually calling for her father. She seemed bitterly disappointed that he didn't come, 19. Laurel ran away shortly after the accident. She stayed within the city of Tacoma, at Raymond Juvenile Hall, until arrangements were made for her to stay with her father in California. Not liking San Bernardino schools, she returned to her mother, but soon moved in with her sister. By then, Willow was married with two young children and living in Seattle. When Laurel was 17, she told a friend at Kings Garden High School that she had been sexually molested by her brother-in-law, Willow's husband. She sounded at the time as though that were the only sexual abuse she had ever suffered. Her allegations were disproven and Willow contacted their dad and received permission for Laurel to get psychiatric counseling. Willow and her husband were told by the psychiatrist not to continue allowing Laurel to live with them, she's a danger to your children. 20. Laurel graduated from King's Garden, 21, and enrolled in what was then called Seattle Pacific College in September of 1959, 22. Marie Hollowell, the school's dean of women who had been a special friend to Willow, also took an interest in trying to draw Laurel out. 23. Laurel soon told a classmate that she had been molested sexually, perhaps by members of the college staff, and that her mother had driven her to the bad side of town to be a prostitute. In a meeting with Marie Hollowell, Willow, and a psychiatrist, Laurel admitted she had made the stories up to impress her new friend. Because of this controversy, the school recommended psychiatric care for Laurel. Soon after, she attempted suicide by cutting her wrists, 24. Young adulthood. By September of 1960 Laurel was living in Southern California with her father, Frank. He was a physician for the Santa Fe Railroad and had a private practice in San Bernardino. When Laurel was 19, she wrote some of her old friends that her father was sexually abusing her, 25. Enrolled in the University of Redlands, Laurel majored in music, 26, she directed the choir at First Assembly of God Church in Rialto, 
where she and her father were members, 27, though she gained acceptance through her musical talent and skill, her emotional troubles were not resolved. Her pastor, Eugene Boone, was called in numerous times because Laurel had cut her arms in apparent suicide attempts. This went on over the six years Reverend Boone knew her. While still in college, during 1962, she met a Pentecostal evangelist couple, Norman and Billy Gordon. Billy described her relationship with Laurel this way. I like to help people, that's what I'm about. But Laurel was a hopeless case. We met her after a service we testified at. A car pulled up in our driveway. I opened my door and invited her in, but she didn't come in. I closed my door. I heard her voice, so I opened my door again. She said, please, come out and help me. I heard you testify tonight. Please come and talk because I'm not the kind of person you want in your house. Laurel ended up practically living with the Gordons for most of 1962. During that time the stress was so intense that Billy went from 140 to 100 pounds. Her children begged her to ask Laurel to leave because Laurel was consuming all of Billy's time and attention. There was nothing left for anyone but Laurel, 28. Laurel told a series of stories to Billy and Norman Gordon. She told them that Frank Cole Wilson was her natural father, and that her natural mother had died when she was very small. Her father had quickly remarried, and her stepmother had physically and sexually abused her ever since. The Gordons assumed that Laurel was living with her father and stepmother. In reality, Frank and Laurel lived alone at 1580 North Vista in Rialto. Laurel also became blind while with them, and they prayed frequently for her healing. However, they began to suspect she wasn't really blind. One day when they were driving past the University of Redlands, Laurel pointed out a landmark. Confronted, Laurel tried to say she'd felt a familiar bump in the road, but finally admitted she had faked her blindness to obtain sympathy and attention. Billy told us that one afternoon Laurel showed up with a huge red bump and bruises on her forehead. She asked Billy to protect her, her stepmother had hit her on the head with an unopened can of peaches, 29, again, confronted by an unbelieving Billy, she confessed that she had hit herself with the can to gain sympathy. Laurel's break with the Gordons was precipitated by an incident that took place in their home while Norman was out. Laurel, locking herself in the bathroom, broke a glass vase and proceeded to cut her face in three places. She then charged out of the room with the broken vase, straight for Billy's neck. Billy's grown son wrestled the glass away from her, 30. Shortly after this, Laurel returned home to her father. A woman who was a member of the Hemet First Assembly of God Church befriended her and attempted to help Laurel, whom she considered troubled and emotionally depressed. This woman is the first of three of Laurel's closest acquaintances who asked to have their names withheld. We have labeled them Friend 1, Friend 2, and Friend 3. Friend 1 confirmed that Laurel cut her own arm several different times. When Laurel was 22, 1963, she told Friend 1 that she had been seduced into a lesbian relationship with two church women, 31, on June 7, 1964. She graduated from Redlands with a bachelor's in music, with a special secondary education teaching credential in music, 32. Soon after this, Laurel disappeared from home. Later she told Friend 1 that she had run away to Teen Challenge in Los Angeles and gone through their drug abuse program, then had become a drug counselor. Her friend angrily pointed out that Laurel's drug use was a lie. According to Friend 1, Laurel admitted she had never had a drug problem but had made the story up for Teen Challenge, 33. Laurel was still living with her father when he died of a heart attack at home. Dr. Frank Cole Wilson was pronounced dead at 8.45 a.m. on January 4, 1965, 34. Willow and Rose, their mother, came from Washington for the services. Rose stayed on for a while, signing a probate paper with Laurel on February 5th and attending Sunday services at the same First Assembly of God in Rialto where Laurel was the choir director. Probate on Dr. Wilson's estate took almost two years and wasn't finally settled until the end of 1967. Mid to late twenties. 
Laurel met Frank Austin at church while she was living for a time at 208 Valley View in Hemet. He was almost one and a half years younger than Laurel and was the son of a Pentecostal holiness minister, 35, they dated three or four times and then, Frank told us, she suggested marriage. She seemed like a nice Christian girl and it seemed like a good thing to do, so we did. They were married on March 11, 1966, with friend two and Frank's father as witnesses, 36. At that point, what one wishes could have been the beginning of a happy story instead led to only more pain and failure. Within a week the troubled couple, their marriage still unconsummated, sought counsel from friend one and her husband, 37, here we reluctantly include comments from Frank which are very private. We do so only because Satan's underground claims that Laurel had been raped and abused since childhood, had been involved in hardcore prostitution for at least five years, and had borne three children by this time. Frank told us the marriage was eventually consummated, and that Laurel was a virgin until then. Frank and Laurel agreed to an annulment, granted on May 17, 1966. Laurel's desperate need for attention was described by friend too. I felt sorry for Laurel. She called me one night at midnight. I went over and found her cutting her arm with a paring knife. She had made several cuts already. She so desperately needed someone to say they loved her, in Christian love. Laurel didn't have anybody, because she would turn them against her by wearing them down. She would go from one friend to the next, knowing they wouldn't be her friends for long. That's sad. There were a lot of times I had to be with her when I wanted to be with my kids. I've apologized to my kids for that. I will never allow anybody, ever again, to suck me in the way she did. Laurel turned 25 in August of 1966. She taught music at Hemet Junior High School for one and one half years from September 1966 through January 1968, 38, her picture in the school yearbook shows her smiling next to the choir, 39, this was the only public school teaching recorded for her, although her renewed teaching credential is valid until 1991, 40. Laurel appears to have been employed at the California Institute for Women in Chino, probably from 1969 to 1971. She says she was a correctional counselor on her alumni report. She gave the same information to Willow and others throughout the years. She told yet another friend that she had been a guard. However, we have been unable to confirm either job with the prison personnel office or with the California Penal System Office of Past Employment. During this time she was still active in various assemblies of God churches and gained a small popularity as a Christian singer in different churches. 41. She joined a singing group led by Delpha Nichols called Delpha and the Witnesses. The male singer, Ken Sanders, and his wife invited her to live with them in Bakersfield, 42. She has lived in the Bakersfield area since 1971. Delpha, Ken, and Laurel sang at many churches and toured on a limited basis. Ken remembers Laurel as a nice Christian woman with good values, but who was also emotionally troubled. Though the witnesses stayed in church people's homes while touring, Laurel insisted she needed a private hotel room. One time, Ken related, she became frantic when told they would be staying with nearby church people. Laurel attacked Delpha so violently she nearly clawed Delpha's dress off. Laurel got a hotel room, 43. Ken stated that Laurel did talk about her mother sexually abusing her and offering her to various men abuse which had church-related overtones. One night, when Laurel was still living with us, I took out the Bible for our family devotions. She jumped up and ran off into her room and locked the door behind her. Later, she said it was because when they used to do these perversions to her, that's how it would begin. It was in the name of Jesus they did this stuff. Her thirties. Delpha and her husband Willie loved Laurel. They felt sorry for the girl nobody seemed to love, and though she was an adult of 30 or so, they legally adopted her and she called them her family. One of the many stories Laurel told Delpha was that her mother had abused her so horribly she was sterile and could never have children, 44. Laurel wrote many stories of her childhood and family in letters to Delpha. 
Delpha saved them until Laurel contacted her more recently and requested she burn them all. We asked Delpha why Laurel had wanted them burned. She didn't want anybody to see them, I guess. She was telling me about her past. Delpha continued, there's a lot of things I don't understand. I'm mixed up about a lot of things about Laurel like that. By 1973, Laurel had written and copyrighted some Christian songs while with the group, 45, Delpha and the Witnesses broke up in 1974. Ken calmly observed, it was because of Laurel, of course. Laurel and the Sanders continued to go to the same church in 1974, pastored by David Joyner, 46, Laurel was living at 1405 White Lane in Bakersfield. Though she still sang some with Delpha, she also accompanied other Christian singers both at her own church and others. During this time she gave private piano lessons. Ken Sanders and Pastor Joyner both recalled Laurel and another church member, Friend 3, leaving the church sometime during 1975. Ken didn't see Laurel again until 1984, when he saw her at a special church service in honor of Delpha and Willie. Laurel told a number of stories to Friend 3, who lived with her for a time. Among other things, Laurel told her that her scars were from her mother's abuse. The friend explained to us what she now believes to be the story's real source. Have you read the book Sybil, 47? I didn't read it until I started taking my psychology classes. I realized that most of the stories Laurel had told me about her mom's abuse were taken literally from Sybil. You know, the torture with enemas, the piano, the whole bit. Even the part about the mom's abuse with small sharp objects that rendered her incapable of ever having children. Laurel took that directly out of the book. Friend 3 explained to us Laurel's claim that the physical and sexual abuse continued until she went to live with her father, and then it all stopped. As the friend talked with us, she shared the destructive influence Laurel had on her own life. At that time I was pretty vulnerable. There were problems in my church, my father had just been brain damaged in a severe accident. My brother was going through a very traumatic time and my husband and I were having trouble in our marriage. I had two small children, and I was extremely unhappy. For me, I'm very interested in music. She accompanied me when I sang. She was giving my daughter piano lessons, and we started being friends. She was very happy, always laughing, always very up. And gradually, manipulation is what it is. Where I was the weakest, that's where she worked her way in and I was so involved. She tried to separate me from my mom and dad, and at one point actually told them I didn't need them anymore, she'd take care of me. She began to manipulate things so I was really putting distance between myself and my husband, more and more and more. And then I felt trapped. How could I extricate myself from this awful mess I'd gotten into? For me, it got so bad that my way out was, I cannot deal with any of this anymore, I'm never going to get free. The scariest part about it was that it seemed so normal, I'll just go to sleep and never wake up again. I took every pill in the house. I had a bottle of sleeping pills, I had a bottle full of pain tablets, another of Valium, and I took them all. My family discovered me in time. I had to spend some time in a mental hospital, but the Lord saw me through. I think she was scary 15 years ago, and she still scares me. She does not. She really doesn't know the truth. I suspected there were others she used like me. Thank you, Lord, because I did find out in time. Through the latter part of the 1970s Laurel's physical and emotional health deteriorated, incapacitating her from full-time work. She was able to live on the small amount state disability paid plus offering private music lessons. Laurel spent much of her time hospitalized. When friend one from the Hemet Assembly of God Church visited her in the hospital in the late 1970s, Laurel seemed helpless, physically and emotionally. She told her friend she had a rare blood disease shared by only nine people in the world. 48. Read a brief summary of the various versions and contradictory stories Lauren has told her friends. In 1978, Willow and her family visited Laurel at 2401 Christmas Tree Lane in Bakersfield. 
Willow described the meeting as short and strained. Laurel was distant and explained she had been very ill and in and out of the hospital. She kept repeating that she had a new family now. I got the feeling she was telling us she didn't need me or mother, Willow recalled. This was the last time Willow saw or heard from her sister. The years before Satan's underground. Laurel read Stormy, 49, a book chronicling author Stormy Omartian's abuse as a child, and contacted Omartian. Laurel and a close friend, Sherry Delin Williams, began a support group for battered women called Victims Against Sexual Abuse. The local Bakersfield press covered the group's activities, and author Joyce Landorf heavily invited Laurel to be a guest on her radio program. Laurel talked about child and spouse abuse and related her own stories, 50. In 1985 the Bakersfield area was rocked by charges concerning a large ritualistic child abuse ring operating in Bakersfield. The story received national media attention. At that time, Laurel was giving private piano lessons to the child of one of the Bakersfield investigators, Sergeant Bob Fields, 51. At one point she contacted Colleen Ryan, the district attorney handling prosecution of the case. Ryan told us, she called me a couple times. I don't really remember what her link was, except she was somehow entwined with the two women, defendants, in the case. 52. Ryan's office and the investigators found her testimony useless. 53. Laurel then met Pat Thornton, a foster mother caring for some of the children whose family members were implicated in the child abuse case. Laurel told Pat she had personal knowledge of what was going on and was afraid for her life. Pat told us. For a short period of time, I was like Laurel's mother. She would call me at all hours of the day or night, hysterical and I had to drop everything I was doing to go to her or at least talk her through her hysteria on the phone. She almost consumed my life. It was very difficult for me, because I was trying to help the children I was caring for, too. It was like she was another one of the kids. During this time Laurel first began mentioning Satanism as part of her story. According to Laurel, she was still being harassed and threatened by Satanists. This would have been in 1985 and 1986. In fact, she claimed they were still picking her up late at night and forcing her to watch their rituals, including ritual child abuse. She told Pat this as the basis for her inside knowledge of the Bakersfield cases. There was no victor in Laurel's stories to Pat. Instead there were two men, Elliot, who was the leader of this massive ritualistic abuse and pornography ring, and Jonathan, to whom she had been a love slave for many years. Laurel told Pat that Jonathan had branded her forehead with a circular red hot brand so everyone would know she was his love slave. That's why, Laurel said, she always wore bangs to cover her forehead even though Pat couldn't tell the scar from typical forehead wrinkles. One night, Laurel called Pat hysterically claiming that Jonathan had run her off the road in a murder attempt, 54. One of the most macabre stories Laurel told Pat was that she had a cassette tape of her son Joey's death screams during the satanic ritual in which he was killed, and a black and white photograph of baby Joey that had been taken after his death. Laurel never showed Pat the picture or let her hear the tape, explaining they would upset Pat's sensitive nature. Concerning Laurel's own history, Laurel claimed she had become pregnant for the first time when she was 14 and that the many scars on her arms were caused by the pornographers and Satanists torturing her. Laurel said her father had died in 1983, and his death had freed her from the hold the ring had on her, but it took almost three years for her to realize it and finally try to break away. 55. Laurel said she also had personal knowledge of the McMartin Preschool Ritual Child Abuse Case in Manhattan Beach, California, near Los Angeles. She wondered if Pat knew anyone associated with that case. In the spring of 1986 Pat introduced Laurel to Judy Hansen, an investigator who was working with some of the parents in the McMartin case. Judy described her first meeting with Laurel. She told me she was terminally ill and in very great pain. She had a wheelchair in the back of her car and she was using oxygen. Her apartment was immaculate. During our conversation, she told me the pain was too much for her to continue. She had me get a bottle filled with thick white liquid out of the refrigerator for her, 
which she then took large drinks from. She told me it was morphine for her pain. I didn't notice any difference in her speech or actions after the medicine. Laurel claimed she'd been abused as a child and had been trapped in this ritual child abuse ring, both in Bakersfield and with the McMartin Group in Los Angeles. She said she could give us names, places, dates, and events, but that she was afraid of physical harm or even death at the hands of the ring if they suspected she was talking. 56. Laurel gave Judy a manuscript containing her stories, and a tape of two Joyce Landorf Heatherly shows she appeared on. According to Judy, she arranged for Laurel to record her experiences and information in a videotape done by Bob Curry, 57. Bob, one of the parents whose children were involved in the McMartin abuse case, had been looking for a credible adult witness or victim to give support to the children's testimonies. The video was made in multiple sessions at a Bakersfield motel. Respecting Laurel's concerns about her own safety, Bob never revealed more than her mouth and chin in the video. After the taping was completed, Bob took the video home. But he never used it. Other McMartin parents who saw the video or who were present during the taping told us they agreed with Bob, Laurel's story wasn't credible. We asked parent Leslie Floberg why she distrusted Laurel's story concerning the Manhattan Beach activities. She replied, That's just it. She seemed to be telling us exactly what we wanted to hear. Whatever we thought was happening, she said she had witnessed it. She described most things in very general terms. The only things she described in detail were incidents that had already been described in detail on a recently aired CNN television special about our case. Somebody who knew nothing about the case, but who had watched that television program, could have given us as credible a testimony. We asked Pat Thornton, who was present during the taping, why she didn't believe Laurel's video. She didn't give concrete, specific, testable details that hadn't already been reported in the news. It was almost like she felt safe in repeating what we already knew from other sources, but she didn't want to say something new we could test. I got the feeling that she didn't really have any first-hand knowledge. The stories Laurel told on the video for the McMartin parents are very different from the stories in Satan's Underground. In the video she said that both of her parents, mother and father, were involved in pornography and Satanism. She told how, when she was a child, even after her father left home, the three of them would meet at the satanic abuse rituals. She said that she lived in the basement of a farmhouse with farm animals, the same animals she was forced to pose with for the pornographic pictures. Laurel explained her many scars by saying that her mother forced her to pleasure her sexually, and that if she did not do so quickly enough, her mother would take razor blades and slice her arms and legs to punish her. Laurel also explained that she had spent two years of her life in a warehouse on Wilshire Boulevard in Los Angeles with other baby breeders, where she had two children killed in ritualistic snuff films, 58. All six parents who witnessed the video and or its filming attested to us that she said she had participated in an ongoing lesbian relationship with Virginia McMartin, then the star defendant in the McMartin preschool case. They also agree that she claimed to have been present while ritual abuse of children went on. According to Bob Curry, he provided the access Laurel wanted to Johanna Michelson, Christian author of The Beautiful Side of Evil. Michelson had talked briefly with a few of the McMartin parents. After Laurel became close to Johanna, she asked for her video back from Bob. Bob hand-delivered the original video to Johanna. Laurel then broke off all communication with Judy Hansen, Pat Thornton, Bob Curry, and the other McMartin parents involved. Only a few months later, Laurel's story of Satan's Underground was published by Harvest House with Johanna Michelson's strong encouragement. Johanna Michelson admitted to us that she had viewed the video, including the segment concerning Virginia McMartin. She first explained to us that the legal ramifications of the McMartin story were too complex to deal with, but when we asked point blank if she believed the lesbianism story, she replied, I don't know. We asked if it seemed odd to be unsure if Laurel's McMartin story was true, yet believe totally in and help publish another equally fantastic tale from the same source. Johanna did not answer the question, 59. 
Parent Leslie Floberg concluded our conversation in an angry outburst. Put this in your magazine. I feel raped by the so-called Christians who've promoted Lauren Stratford as a victim just like our children. What proof exists of Laurel's testimony? Our inclination has always been to give Laurel the benefit of the doubt, to presume her story true until proven otherwise. If Laurel's story were true, many people would be wholly ignorant of the torment she had lived through. There would also be details which could never be verified on paper or other documentation. Yet at the same time, there would be a number of mundane details that couldn't escape outside notice. As we proceeded, we used this basic principle, if a person proves trustworthy in the normal details of their lives, which can be confirmed in normal ways, it is easier to trust them when they make claims about events which cannot be verified. There were two considerations, first, what evidence exists or would exist if Laurel's story is true? In other words, can her story be verified? Second, are there any evidences or facts which contradict or cast doubt on her story? Can her story be falsified? One more thing must be said. We believe that when extreme or extraordinary claims are presented as objective truth, the burden of proof lies upon the claimant to give evidence for what he or she affirms. This should especially hold true for Christian authors and publishers. In our opinion, Satan's underground manifestly falls into such a category. From the beginning, we were led to believe that substantial validation for Laurel's testimony exists. Laurel's book contains a moving portrayal of how safe she felt when Hal Lindsay publicly warned Satanists to stay away from her because he had the goods on anyone who might retaliate. 60. Johanna Michelson, however, told us that Hal was bluffing when he said this. 61. Laurel claimed she had passed the untold facts, example, Victor's name, etc., along to people like Johanna Michelson and Ken Wooden. 62. Harvest House told us they possessed documentation more than sufficient to prove her. Story, 63. However, the most stunning element of the true Laurel Wilson story is that no one even checked out the main details. When we contacted Laurel's mother, sister, brother-in-law, cousin, church friends, in fact, anyone who would have known Laurel during the book's most crucial years, we were shocked to discover that, in nearly every case, we were the first people to have contacted them, 64. We had a lengthy conversation with Laurel, asking for any documentation of her story. She told us that many parties, including Johanna Michelson and others from the US Justice Department on down, had advised her not to give us anything. She then warned us that further research on our part would be futile. The trail's been cold for over 25 years, she said. You can't hope to find confirmation now. 65. In our conversation, Laurel said John Robun was one of her advisors and implied he was from the Justice Department. Johanna Michelson and Lynn Laboreal, a kind woman who believes Laurel's story, also used Robun's name as a defense for Laurel's story. So we called him. Robun actually represents the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, a respected organization which is not an agency of the U.S. Department of Justice, nor any federal office. Robun also disavows being on any advisory board, much less Lauren Stratford's. I have never seen any objective documentation for Lauren's story, he stated, and I do not consider her story credible. He told us Laurel had called him in September, asking his advice on whether she should provide us with documentation. Robun asked her what kind of documentation she would provide. She said the problem was that she didn't have names, dates, places, etc. Robun's reply was, well, you can't very well give it to them, then, can you? 66. Please show us the evidence. Since we had already, twice, attempted to confront Laurel with our questions, we felt our only remaining Christian duty was to Harvest House, Laurel's publisher. Upon contacting them, we explained that the evidence we had collected was virtually overwhelming and ask them as responsible publishers to carry the burden of proof. Please show us the evidence which led you to publish Satan's Underground. For instance, we asked them if it was possible to produce an eyewitness to any of Laurel's pregnancies. If we accept that Laurel had three children by brutal rape, 
whose births were unrecorded and who had been secretly killed, she still had a public life which included attending high school and college, church attendance, and playing concert piano. Since her pregnancy would have been showing during her high school and college years, there should have been an abundance of witnesses. After all, one should first have proof that a child existed before asking others to believe that the child was murdered. Eileen Mason, editor-in-chief at Harvest House, informed us that Laurel could not produce such a witness. It strains one's credulity to think that no one would notice a teenager who was pregnant three times, yet never ended up with a baby. Remember, this all supposedly took place in the late 1950s or early 1960s, while she was singing with Pentecostal church groups, attending Christian schools, and living with family members other than her mother. In reality, at least ten people who knew her quite well during that time are emphatic, Laurel was never pregnant during her teens or early twenties. Harvest House explained what they felt constituted proof of her testimony. They had a three-part test, one, several staff members talked with Laurel at different times and got the same stories from her, and all of the staff members were impressed with her sincerity, two, they talked with experts who confirmed that such things have happened to others, and, three, they gathered character references for her from her supporters, 67. These tests can establish consistency and plausibility, but they are not tests to establish the validity of actual historical events. Over the past 10 years, we have heard stories from several victim impersonators that paralleled those of real drug dealers and cult members, but this similarity was not proof that the victim impersonator's particular story was true, 68. On the other hand, we know that Laurel's book conflicts with known history, and over the past 20 years, she has not only given contradictory stories, but those who knew her testify that she has been disturbed and manipulative. If genuine evidence for the major facets of Laurel's testimony exists anywhere, we are still willing to examine it. In light of the inability of those supporting Laurel's story to provide such evidence, the overwhelming weight of our evidence must stand. As believers, our concepts of ethics and truth should be higher, not lower, than those of the secular press. When a publisher issues a testimony which he knows is likely to be sensationalistic, we believe he is obligated to ask what constitutes verification of that testimony. Certain claims and assertions require greater verification than others. This is not to lay all the blame at the doors of Harvest House. Other Christian publishers have recently released equally sensationalistic survivor stories. Though publishers have the responsibility to test a story before offering it to the public, we as readers are also accountable. If we exercised the gift of discernment more often, publishers would be persuaded to offer books that can stand the test. As individual Christian readers, we cannot investigate every questionable testimony. However, we should encourage the publishers whose books we buy to do that job for us. It is not wrong to question a story which initially seems fantastic and offers no corroboration or documentation. This article is not a condemnation of Laurel Wilson. Though we don't know, and may never know, the true causes of her problems, Laurel evidently has been emotionally disturbed for most of her life. Emotionally disturbed people should receive compassion and empathy from their friends and other Christians, and constructive, biblical therapy from Christians whose special gifts are counseling. 69. Laurel Wilson needs her Christian friends to comfort her in her distress to love her enough to commit themselves to helping her resolve her problems according to biblical principles. The story of Satan's underground is not true, but Laurel's emotional distress is real. Our prayer is that she gets the help she needs. However, when Laurel Wilson wrote Satan's Underground and Johanna Michelson and Harvest House Publishers promoted it, the story stepped from the world of therapy to the world of testimony. Satan's Underground has become the basis, the foundation, for Lauren Stratford's authority as an expert on ritualistic abuse and as a counsellor of other victims. Because the story is not true, her foundation is illusory, and her expertise and counselling qualifications are non-existent. That is why this investigation had to be conducted, and this article had to be written. As Laurel's old friend who nearly ended her own life told us, I don't want to see her counselling anyone. If she counsels other people as she did me, there are going to be a lot of people in real trouble.
Lauren, Lauren Stratford, From Satanic Ritual Abuse to Jewish Holocaust Survivor By Bob and Gretchen Passantino and John Trott The story before the story, ten years ago a shocking story of pornography, satanic ritual abuse, torture, rape, and infanticide was a best-selling book that brought its author to the stages, pulpits, and broadcast booths of America's television shows, churches, and radio programs. Lauren Stratford's story, Satan's Underground, became one of the key sources for promoting, perpetuating, and validating the satanic ritual abuse, SI, adult survivor, and repressed memories hysteria that peaked in the early 1990s. Many who said they were adult survivors of SI, and who had recovered their repressed memories in a therapeutic setting, pointed to Satan's Underground as external support for their subjective, directed counseling experiences. The book was promoted by its author, publisher, and major Christian personalities such as Johanna Michelson, Hal Lindsey, Mike Warnke, and Bob Larson as documented, factual, and corroborated by a wealth of evidence. From Laurel Wilson to Lauren Stratford, Christian satanic ritual abuse survivor, as it turned out, none of it was true. There was no documentation, corroboration, or evidence. Careful research by us and Cornerstone editor John Trott, revealed that author Lauren Stratford was actually Laurel Rose Wilson I, a troubled woman from Washington State who spent most of her teen and adult life fabricating horrendous stories of victimization by a variety of people in a variety of settings. She repeatedly threatened suicide and practiced self-mutilation. In the mid-1980s, when the scare about ritual child abuse in daycares gained momentum, she produced a new story incorporating SI's most sensational features. That story metamorphosed over three years to become the story of Satan's Underground. Our investigation, published in late 1989, was the first in-depth analysis of a particular testimony of satanic ritual abuse. Two, it provided the first concrete evidence that at least some such stories could be the result of troubled minds, bad therapy, and credulity regarding Satanism and not the result of actual events. Although the evidence was overwhelming and the original publisher and Lauren even admitted that she repeatedly said things that were not true, some continued to believe her. Another publisher reissued Satan's Underground and her two subsequent books, I Know You're Hurting and Stripped Naked. Three although she never enjoyed the same fame or fortune, she continued to speak in churches and before other groups, to participate in support groups and SI survivor advocacy groups, and to counsel. She continued to advance her Satan's underground story and assumed the position that anyone who doubted her or asked for proof was wittingly or not a pawn of the satanic conspiracy. As she had done in the past when her stories were found out, Lauren turned the focus on herself as a victim of callous disbelief and advanced her faucets as prima facie evidence that she must be a victim of what she said she was or she wouldn't have been so emotionally disturbed as to tell so many untruths. In Stripped Naked She tried to compare the SI survivor's lack of evidence with the clandestine nature of Nazi atrocities, saying, Where's the evidence, you cry? I quote Raoul Hilberg, the great historian who spoke on Claude Landsman's epic film, Shoah, An Oral History of the Holocaust. In speaking of the Nazi Germans and their hideous atrocities, Mr. Hilberg says, They did not copyright or patent their achievements, and they prefer obscurity. This is also true of those who are the perpetrators of cult crimes. They do not copyright or patent their achievements, and they prefer obscurity. 4. This and other references to the Holocaust in Stripped Naked have turned out, in retrospect, to foreshadow the next incredible story of abuse told by Lauren Stratford. 5. From Lauren Stratford to Laura Grabowski, Jewish Holocaust survivor, in the years since the discrediting of Satan's underground, Lauren developed a new story that put her in the midst of another survivor support community this one for actual survivors of a massive horror shamefully hidden by its perpetrators, but chillingly documented by overwhelming amounts of both eyewitness and historical evidence. Lauren Stratford became Laura Grabowski, child survivor of Auschwitz-Birkenau, a Polish Jew who was experimented on by the infamous Dr. Joseph Mengel, liberated to a Krakow orphanage at the end of the war, brought to the United States, and adopted by a Gentile couple at age 9 or 10. 
Lauren Stratford may have hoped that her old identity and old story would remain secret from her newfound Holocaust survivor friends, but the echoes of her past continue to reverberate through her new life. Different but still the same, she didn't write a book this time, but she did copyright a poem, We Are One, in honor of her fellow sufferers from the camps, available on several internet sites devoted to memory of the Holocaust. Point six, she didn't launch her story on the television and radio talk show circuit, but she did perform an original composition, Ode to the Little Ones, before a crowd of Holocaust survivors and supporters. She then granted an interview to a Jewish publication. 7. She didn't collect royalties or honorariums for her new testimony, but she did collect funds for Jewish Holocaust survivors in need. 8. Replacing her cross with a star of David, and her in Christ with Shalom, she joined a community where she believed she would be relatively safe from scrutiny and unlikely to encounter those who were aware of her many previous stories. As before, she attributed her physical ailments to the abuse she had suffered. Before she pointed to the scars of her self-mutilation as the work of her abusive parents, the pornographers, or the Satanists, now she points to the scars on her arms and whispers, Mengel's child the work of Dr. Mengel and his medical experiments. 9. Before she feigned blindness for sympathy, now she claims Dr. Mengel injected chemicals into her eyes. 10. Before she claimed a rare blood disease as a consequence of the years of torture and abuse at the hands of the pornographers or Satanists, now she claims she is afflicted with a life-threatening blood disorder because of Dr. Mengel's experiments. 11. In previous stories, she claimed either that she was forced to have children that were killed for pornography and or Satanism or that she was rendered sterile by sexual abuse from her parents and others. Now she says Dr. Mengel sterilized her. 12. In her satanic stories, the abuse, whether from her mother, the prostitution ring, the pornographers, or the Satanists, began when she was four and continued throughout her childhood and into her adulthood. Now she says she was in Auschwitz-Birkenau until it was liberated at the end of the war, and then in a Krakow orphanage until her adoption by American Gentiles in 1950.13. In all her stories, past and present, she repeats common refrains. For example, each new confidant is told that Lauren has never been able to tell her horrible secret before. In a letter to a Holocaust survivor couple, she said, I have remained silent about being a child survivor for over 50 years. 14. In another letter she said that she was still fearful about coming out of the closet. 15. Over the years a succession of her confidants heard her say that she had never had family before, that she had always been alone but now experienced real love for the first time. She told Holocaust survivors at group meetings that they had become her family, that, now I won't die alone. I'm among friends, 16 of someone else, she said, he is like a brother to me. We cried together and hugged each other and shared things of little kids in the barracks, 17. The proof that Lauren Stratford is Laura Grabowski, some of her Holocaust survivor friends are reluctant to believe that she is not telling the truth about her identity and past. Some of her friends in the SI survivor support system seem willing to defend and protect her no matter what. 18 Most of both kinds of acquaintances want nothing to do with the issue at all. 19 Sensing, properly, we believe, that even if Lauren is lying, her reasons are psychologically complex and not merely for profit. Even those Holocaust survivor acquaintances who doubted her claims were concerned that she not be accused without convincing evidence. As Christian journalists working for a Christian publication, we take biblical mandates regarding criticism and accusation seriously. The Bible explicitly encourages constructive public criticism of what has been done publicly, especially by public figures. 20 However, public criticism must be done according to the biblical principle that rejects hearsay, uncorroborated opinions, and unfounded accusations. The principle of two or three witnesses is established in the Old Testament, Jude 17 6, 1915, affirmed by Jesus Christ in the Gospels, Matt 18:16. 20, John 5 31-47, 8 14-18, and reiterated in the epistles, 1 Tim, 5 19. This is the pattern we followed in coming to the conclusion that Lauren Stratford is now claiming to be Laura Grabowski, Holocaust survivor, and that she could not have had a secret origin as a Polish-Jewish concentration camp orphan.
The written evidence, two days after her birth, Laurel Rose Wilson was the name recorded on her birth certificate in Washington State on August 18, 1941.21 Laurel was born to an unwed mother, Marian Disbrow, and adopted at birth by Frank and Rose Wilson. 22 Rose Wilson's parents, Laurel's maternal grandparents, were Polish Catholics named Anton and Rosolio Grabowski. Anton immigrated to the United States in the late 1890s and became a leader among Polish Catholics in Tacoma, Washington. Although Rosolio died before Rose was grown, Laurel knew her grandfather and visited him during her childhood. He and Rosolio are buried in the Tacoma Cemetery.23. The name documentation does not stop there. In a letter to a Holocaust survivor, Lauren signed her name Lauren Grabowski and then typed beneath that Lauren Grabowski Stratford. 24 in various meetings, interviews, letters, internet postings, and published pieces, she identifies herself variously as Laura or Lauren Grabowski. On the same letter where she designates herself as Lauren Grabowski Stratford, she types her address and phone number, on file. The identical phone number and address is in the records of the Child Holocaust Survivors Group of Los Angeles, the World Jewish Restitution Organization application, and another letter signed Laura Grabowski. 25 This is the same address that appears on the credit header information for Lauren Stratford Laurel Wilson from 1990 to present 26 on the public record of Lauren Stratford Laurel Wilson's bankruptcy of 1994, 27 and on an envelope hand addressed by Lauren Stratford to us.28. In addition to corresponding name and address evidence, the social security number listed on Lauren Grabowski's World Jewish Restitution Organization application matches that of Lauren Stratford Laurel Wilson and was issued in the state of Washington between 1956 and 1959.29. Laurel Wilson's birth date of August 18, 1941 is the same one Lauren Grabowski listed on her application to the World Jewish Restitution Organization, on Lauren Stratford Laurel Wilson's credit header report and social security report, Lauren Stratford Laurel Wilson's California Department of Motor Vehicles driver's license record, Laurel Wilson's University of Redlands alumni file, and Laurel Wilson's marriage certificate.30. The location of her birth in Washington State, not Poland, is listed on her birth certificate, the bill from the hospital where she was born, 31 alumni records, driver's license, and marriage license. The signature identification of Laura Grabowski with Lauren Stratford Laurel Wilson is also overwhelming. A comparison of the following signatures, some of which are reproduced below, shows that the same individual signed them all, 32. Laurel Rose Wilson the 17th of April 1964 University of Redlands alumni file. Lauren Stratford 1988 edition of Satan's Underground, page 17. L. Stratford the 22nd of May 1991 envelope to Passantinos. Lauren Stratford the 22nd of May 1991 letter to Passantinos. Lauren Grabowski the 20th of June 1997 letter to Holocaust survivor. Lauren Grabowski the 15th of July 1997 letter to Holocaust survivors. Laura Grabowski the 14th of November 1998 letter to Holocaust survivor. The photographic evidence, there are two significant issues that photograph evidence addresses, first, that Lauren Stratford Laurel Wilson and Laura Grabowski are the same person, second, that there is no possibility that little Laura, the Auschwitz survivor, could have been switched in 1950, or at any other time, with little Laurel from Washington State. A careful comparison of video images from Lauren Stratford's appearances on television programs such as Geraldo in 1988, Oprah, February 17, 1988, and the BBC, July 12, 1992, to the photograph in the April 24, 1998, Jewish Journal article and the upcoming BBC production interview 33 clearly identifies the same woman. The facial characteristics and even the expressions on childhood and adult pictures and video interviews match. The first match, between the faces of Lauren Stratford and Laura Grabowski, is undeniable. The second match, that the same individual who grew to adulthood as Laurel Wilson began her life in the Wilson family, is provided by dozens of photographs from the time she was a newborn through her graduation from high school.
the consistency of facial characteristics and expressions, the presence of her older sister, Willow, who has known Laurel throughout her childhood and teen years, and the visual confirmations that the childhood photographs were taken in the United States, and not Poland, are inescapable. A clearly characteristic picture of Laurel at about four years old with her sister Willow is overlaid with the photographer's stamp reading classic portrait studio, Tacoma, Washington. A Sunday school class picture from around the same time shows a portrait of Jesus on the wall behind Laurel and her classmates. In the tattered photo album that Laurel made for her childhood pictures, next to the bill from St. Joseph's Hospital for her care as a newborn, are five photographs of her as a newborn. Amidst many photographs chronicling her growth from newborn through preschool is a striking photograph of toddler Laurel with her sister Willow in front of three Catholic nuns who worked at St. Joseph's Hospital, where Laurel was born and where their father worked as a doctor. Another photograph shows Laurel and her friends at her fifth birthday party, cake, candles and all. Three photographs from when Laurel was six years old are especially arresting, they were taken in 1947 the date on the car license plate in one picture, and show Laurel, her sister Willow, and Father Frank on a trip to Yellowstone National Park. One picture shows the girls in front of the west entrance sign to the park, the other shows them in front of the sign for the old faithful geezer. The picture of Laurel with her kindergarten classmates couldn't have been taken in a concentration camp or a Krakow orphanage, the healthy, well-dressed children in the midst of their toys are in front of a wall with an American flag, pictures of George Washington and Abraham Lincoln, and an Easter bunny drawn on the chalkboard. A jolly American Santa Claus holds Willow and five- or six-year-old Laurel on his lap in another picture. The photographic evidence is conclusive. Laurel Wilson was born and raised in Washington state and is the same individual who now claims to be Laura Grabowski, child survivor of Auschwitz-Birkenau, subject of gross experimentation by the notorious Dr. Mengel an orphan from a Krakow orphanage. Is there any evidence to support Laurel's Holocaust story? Because we were unable to contact Lauren directly despite our best efforts, 34 we were especially diligent to uncover any evidence or argumentation we could that might support the validity of her current Holocaust story. While some child survivors of the Holocaust would not be able to amass a wealth of documentation for their experiences, most have a continuity of memories, consistent acknowledgement and recognition of their background during their childhood and adulthood, connections with relatives and other survivors, often Nazi documentation in the form of tattoos, records, and other materials, and the testimony and or records of their liberators and others who helped them immediately subsequent to the war. Laura has none of this. What she has are her own statements noted previously in this article and a mutual affirmation of child holocaust survivor status with another individual who calls himself Benjamin Wilkomarski. Space precludes are chronicling his fascinating claims as told in his many public appearances and in his best-selling book, Fragments, Memories of a Wartime Childhood, 1995. Wilkomarski has none of the common supports for his story, and in fact, Voluminous evidence has been uncovered that he is not a Latvian Jewish Holocaust child survivor but instead is Swiss-born Bruno Grosjean, adopted and renamed Bruno Dosaka. This evidence has been examined on television, such as on 60 Minutes early this year, 1999, and in several outstanding journalistic pieces, including Philip Gurevich's The Memory Thief, The New Yorker, June 14, 1999, and Elena Lapin's The Man with Two Heads, Granta, June 1999. Lauren first contacted Wilka Maskey in 1997 after reading his book. She said that his book touched her deeply. Point 35 He then claimed to remember her from the camp and later the orphanage. The two met for the first time in Los Angeles in April 1998 and performed together. She is an accomplished pianist and vocalist, he an equally accomplished clarinetist, on April 19 for the Child Holocaust Survivors Group of Los Angeles the Los Angeles Museum of the Holocaust, and Congregation Shireri Tefila. Although the two support each other's stories, they don't have even a modicum of corroboration or evidence to counter the overwhelming evidence that neither story is true. Lauren says, I think only the individual can decide if he, she is a survivor, 36 in a letter to someone who was looking for corroboration to help Wilkomarski, she explained. I don't know if I know the things you need to help him fact-wise. 
He and I corroborate each other more with memories of the heart. He and I are really in the same position. We cried together and hugged each other and shared things of little kids in the barracks. He remembers my friend, Anna, and that we were always holding hands. He described me as having blonde hair, almost snow white, before he ever saw a photo of me. These are the things I have to offer. Not names and dates and places and the hows and whys and whos and whence. 37. Regardless of the credibility problems facing Walker Maskey, Lauren has worse than what she described in her letter. She not only has a lack of evidence or corroboration for the story she tells, this article has presented an embarrassment of contrary evidence that flatly and completely contradicts her story. Conclusion. Laura Grabowski is Lauren Stratford. She is not a child survivor of the Holocaust, nor is she an adult survivor of satanic ritual abuse. As in the past, she has found a group with which she can identify and that will provide her with the nurturing attention she craves. So why did we pursue first her Satan story and now her Holocaust story? Because she has betrayed the public trust she solicited in each instance, and by claiming a victimization that is not hers, she dishonest and cheapens those who are genuine victims. There are those who point to her false Satan story and say that she was able to fool Christians because Christians are basically ignorant and gullible. There are those who point to her false Holocaust story as an example of a Christian exploiting Jewish suffering for her own benefit. Neither prejudice is warranted, but both are to be expected because we as Christians have failed Lauren. By shrinking from public accountability, excusing ourselves from rehabilitative love in truth, and continuing a platform and acceptance for one who has a lifelong pattern of storytelling, we have partnered in Lauren's deception of the Jewish community. It may be easier to pretend nothing's wrong and either ignore the problem or excuse it, but such Christian irresponsibility harms Lauren, Christian credibility, and a Jewish community that has suffered unspeakably through perhaps the darkest events of this century. Look at the pictures of Menjel's child victims at the beginning of this article. Look at the pictures of Lauren. That's why.